Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For him. Right? For him. For him. Say, for him. For him. He's the master. He's the winner. He's the victor. Hallelujah. Are you ready? Yes. All right. You want to put your hand up before you sit down and say, Jesus, Jesus. I, am ready. I am ready. I open my heart. I open my heart. Thank you for this fresh new day. The sun has come up again. The air is crisp and beautiful. And you've refreshed my soul. And I stand in your presence. A vessel to honor you. Let me receive what you will for me today. Tune my emotions to your emotions. My will to your will. My desires to your desire. I love you. I thank you for your love for me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. <clears throat> It's a great honor to share with you. I've been so far and seen so much, enjoyed so much, have lived such a rich life, have been privileged to, to share such a rich ministry for so many long years, a lifetime, that uh, at this point in my life, all I live for is to try to communicate to other people younger than me some of the things that I have learned over these long years that will help you and put you farther down the road. That's important. And when I look at young people, you know, when, when I was 25 years old, Daisy and I shared for five weeks with uh, Reverend F.F. F. Bosworth and his wife in a crusade, three meetings a day, five weeks, in the Masonic Temple at Detroit, Michigan, seating 5,000 people. And we would take turn about, I'd preach in the morning, he'd preach the afternoon, I'd preach at night, the next day he'd preach the morning, I'd preach the afternoon, he'd preach at night, for five weeks and uh, it was a great great experience and he always expressed such joy that me a 25 year old young man and Daisy a 24 year old young lady were so cognizant of God's will and of God's plan what well, we had read his book we had devoured his book and Kenyon's books. Uh, that'll put you a long way down the road. And uh, he was so thrilled about that. He, and he would, he would pat my hand. He'd say, I'm just tickled pink to see you. You're so young. And you know everything I know already. Think what it'll be in your lifetime. Well, I didn't know everything he knew. But he could tell that we had read his book. It's a great feeling when you get old to, to feel that you can impart something to young people. Everybody. I, 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 I hope I don't demean older people. I'm an older one. So I understand. <laughs> uh, but I know that we folks, as we get older, we get stubborn and we get set in our ways and we're less flexible. I am. I know that. I know that. I'm, I'm older than most of you, probably the oldest person in here. <laughs> you know. And so, uh, so, uh, but young people, they've got their life before them. Now, God can use anybody at any age. And I could tell a lot of stories about a lot of very old people. I'm thinking, I'm thinking of an old woman that she tried all of her life to get a missionary appointment through her organization to go to Africa and never could. So, finally, her husband died. 
she got some insurance money. She said, now I'll go. I don't have to have their, 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 their appointment. And she went. She was 70 when she went. Think of that. And, uh, and she spent her remaining years in Kenya giving out tracts and talking to people, riding buses. And that's a terrible way to travel in Kenya. Riding buses and speaking to people. And she brought so many people to Christ. Now that's the way life is if we make it that way. But we have to take charge. We can't wait on people to make a way for us. We have to make things happen. You probably heard me tell about that old lady over 70 years old in, in Uganda that was absolutely flabbergasted when she saw Daisy preach to that crowd of a uh, quarter of a million people. And, uh, and uh, Daisy and I rotated in preaching. We usually did that in our crusades. People didn't care which one of us preached. Same miracles happened, same wonders, everything. They, they, they couldn't tell whether it was her or me. They didn't care whether it was her or me. And uh, she was a powerful woman. And uh, when this old lady saw her, Daisy preached. And there were some tremendous miracles that occurred, that took place. Uh, that old woman come unglued. And her conclusion was, if God can do that through that woman, he can do that through me. And she just bowed her neck and went after it. And we went back in, in, you know, I don't know, three or four years. Maybe it wasn't even that long. And she was in the... We went back, had, an, had another great campaign and a seminar. In the seminar was where we got to meet her. We didn't, you, you can't meet people in a crusade, such a mass of people. But in the seminar, well, we had about 6,000 people in, in the seminar. And uh, that old lady was there, shining, beautiful, not a tooth in her head, so happy. Oh, but she was happy. And, uh, and fiercely strong in her faith. And... Uh, she told that story. And she told Daisy, she said, I'm just, I said, I, I, I built seven churches already. But said, I, I'd build more, but God didn't give me but seven days in a week. And I have to pastor one church every day. And I only handle seven. See, <laughs> like Wesley, an old circuit, circuit rider. I mean, all she had was her Bible and a bicycle. So you see, there's no limits to what God can do. But when we speak, we address and focus mostly on young people because they're the hope of tomorrow. God believes in tomorrow. He keeps giving us babies, you know. People who don't know anything, and then they learn. Hallelujah. And uh, they can't listen to everything we older folks say, or that'll prejudice them, and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, it, it, it'll, it'll limit them to our level. And we want them to go beyond our level. I figured out a lot of things in life, and I'm going to tell you some of them this morning, uh, that, uh, that were ahead of my generation. And uh, I got opposition for it. But I did it. We did it. Daisy and I, we proved it. And it worked. And, and it brought the world to another level. We've changed our world. We've changed mission policy around the world. We've changed world evangelism policy and thinking and concept. We've, cha we've changed it. We have changed it. And, and uh, it isn't we want to do that to be important. It's just the fact that we were young, had some beautiful ideas, looked at this fresh, and did not allow ourselves to be indoctrinated or limited by concepts that existed at the time. And we went on beyond that. I was very impressed by what, uh, uh, by Pastor Billy Joe, I always am, he's so, he's, he's so uh, non-pretentious and, uh, and good and solid and kind and, and never, never hyping things, just plain vanilla, good vanilla, you know, real good vanilla. Not flashy, but solid. And oh, how the world needs that with all the lights that are glittering today. And I admire them so much. But I appreciate what he said 
he, he reflected on us being a part of, of the church in their starting missionary policy. And he tells that, I've forgotten all about that. Good gracious, I just, we just went over there and had a great time. But it affected them, evidently. And now he says this seminar will, will, he believes it will lead us to another level. That was kind of him to say that. He's the leader of this bunch. But I'm privileged to come in on, on his plat on their platform and uh, minister to you. He trusts me. I trust them. You have to trust people to turn, turn something like this over to a person. Uh, I, I want to be a blessing to you. And today we have some exciting things. I want to, uh, I wrote down seven questions that, uh, that concern these seven principles that we're dealing with. Now we're dealing, we're talking about the Christ connection. We're talking about the first sentence in the book of Acts. It comprised 106 words, four verses. There's not a period till the end of the fourth verse in the King James Version. Other versions, they put some periods. Uh, back in the 16th century, they, they evidently didn't like periods. They liked to see how long they could string out a sentence. Uh, you know, I think that, I think that, uh, that indicated literary expertise to be able to know where to place commas and semicolons and colons and keep traveling without a period. And sometimes it'll almost choke you. <laughs> and this is one of them. Four verses. Four verses. Uh, the first, it's a, but, but, but to me, it's, a, a, it's a, for imagery, it's the first sentence in the new church. It's the first summary sentence. The first summary statement for the followers of Jesus after he went away. Now that's, that's terrific. And so uh, I, I just emphasize this again and, and to help you refocus, we're talking about where the Gospels meet the Acts, where Jesus meets us. For his example comes into our experience. He began it, we continue it. And this sentence is the bridge that connects him with us. The same Jesus, the same God, the same power, the same life, Jesus showed us how. He imparted it to us and turned it over to us and went home and sat down. These seven principles are in this sentence. The former treatise, Have I Made O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. That's the first one, his example. Until the day he was taken up. That's the second one. His inspiration. Watching him. After that he through the Holy Ghost gave commandment. That's the third one. Our mandate. To the apostles whom he had chosen. That's for today. That's his choice of us. His faith in us. To whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. That's the fifth one. His proof for us. Being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining the kingdom of God. That's the sixth one, his presence with us. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. That's the seventh one, experience the power. 
the power. The power. Seven questions. Think about this. I thought it'd just help another way to focus these principles. Now look, what we're talking about, we're not trying to stretch this out. We're talking about seven concepts that if we can embrace them, will guarantee the same miracle life and miracle ministry that Jesus expressed. Now that's what we want. That's what we want. In this first sentence are seven issues that we must cope with. They're simple. It starts out, he is our model. See, if that's not our... Now, that, that, that sounds like a nice sermon outline. That's not the point. Let us remember from this seminar, let us purpose, let us resolve that in our deliberation, in our contemplation of, uh, of life, in our uh, 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 confronting dilemmas and problems and challenges, or in our concepts or in our imaginations for our, the development of our ministry or our ideals in life or whatever we're going to do, Jesus is our example. Watch him. Watch him. Watch him. Analyze him. Don't watch him in the light of the sermons that we have heard. Watch him with fresh eyes. Look again at his life. Read it again. Travel the road with him again and analyze how he dealt with issues. He's our example. He's our example. See, that's fundamental. I'm going to go to Poland and I'm going to bear down on that same thing. See, if I can get the pole. See, the poles aren't acting like Jesus. They're acting like a bunch of pontificants sitting up there. They're not interested in the world. When I get through with them, when I leave Poland, you'll see missionaries will start going to the world. And you don't ever hear of a Polish missionary anywhere today. Well, that'll help. That's no profound thing for down here in America where we have so much truth. Jesus, our example, what's that? What's new? Come on, grow up, tell us something deep. No, I'm a believer that we need... We need to bear down on the fundamentals of Christianity. That's what has kept me fresh all these years. I, I don't have much patience with a lot of things I hear in America. I, I, I find our preachers trying to think up something that no one else thought of. Trying to dig up an idea and that can lead us into superstition. We can have such a passion and such an appetite to be the big cheese and come up with something that we can prance bigger over, you know, that we can, we can, we can, we can get up to the edge of a nonsense. I have no confidence and no patience with any sermon that I cannot go to Kenya under a big banyan tree with the pokots or the Turkanas, the nomad tribes, and stand there and communicate that same message to them. If it won't work for them, I'm not interested. The truth is for the world. We get so sophisticated. We're the most blessed people in the world. Do you know that? Americans are the most blessed people in the world. It is our liberty, it is our freedom that has given us what we have. We have freedom for the devil to do his thing, but freedom for God to do his thing. Norway, beautiful country. I just got, I'm going there this summer. I just got a, a communique from the leaders there. They said, we're so sorry, Brother Osborne, that uh, you won't be able to bring any books or tapes. Well, I hadn't thought of that. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't do that. It's good to do. 
I should do that. I just, Daisy's not here, so she don't arrange it, so I don't do it. I just go on, you know, uh, you know. But, uh, but, but now, look at that. There's Norway. A beautiful country. Who would think of Norway not being free? I mean, we love Norway. Norwegians themselves don't even. They, they think they're as free as American. T.L. Osborne can't even take a tape through customs to Norway and make it available to the people. What are they scared of? See. Yeah, you didn't know that. I didn't either. I got the communique yesterday. See. Sweden's almost as bad. Sweden's doing everything they can to try to stop Ulf Ekman because he's too big. He's doing too much for God. It can't be true. He's right there, that big tent and that big headquarters set up right a stone's throw from the big university in Uppsala, and they just can't stand it. I'm going there again this year. We're the most blessed country in the world. I went to Canada. Canada's scared to death of us down here. Well, I understand that. I mean, we are a big power, and, uh, and we, you know, our television and our radio and all goes up there, and, they, and, and we make our, we're so good at hyping things in America that the Canadians all want to send their money down here. Well, you can appreciate the problem of the government. They've got to keep some money up in Canada. <laughs> you know, we, they can't run their government if we get all the money. And we make our stuff all sound so good that they'd a lot rather send their money down here to us and get it. But if I'd tell you what, what we went through to take a few tapes and books into Canada, you'd be shocked. They even took us aside and frisked us. <laughs> and it, it was embarrassing. It was demeaning. Come into America, it's so free. We're blessed people. But listen, in this great blessing and this great freedom and this great liberty, let's not get such an appetite to be new and be fresh that we run off the dead, dead, the dead end and, and, uh, and uh, entertain superstition. What's up? Listen to these questions. To help you focus these seven issues. Number one, who is your example? These are just guidelines for you. <clears throat> what Im number two, what impact has he made on you? Number three, has he called you? Are you sure? Number four, how valuable are you? How do you measure it? That's today. Number five, what proof do you have that he is real today? Number six. Are you con constantly conscious of his presence in your life? Number seven, how big is his power in you? Now, there's nothing new about any of those questions. But they are, they are, they are guidelines. They are provokers. They are motivators to investigate and to verify our faith in each of those aspects. These are the issues that concern the ministry of young people 
anybody in the world today. The new generation of preachers and pastors and missionaries and evangelists that are coming on that will be in charge of the church of Jesus Christ worldwide tomorrow. The ones that are coming on, they must face these facts. Who is my example? What kind of an impact has he made on me? Have I had an experience? What has happened in my life that I can point to as an impact? Do I really believe I am called of God? Is it because of some dream I had? Or is there a better foundation to it than that? My calling. How do I know what it is? Who am I? See, if I can, if I can get these issues through to the Polish people and the French-speaking people of ten nations of Africa that's coming up in 99 and to India and Indonesia, if I can, if I can deal with these issues and get them through and share some of what I've experienced, it's going to help in the generation tomorrow. It will affect the generation tomorrow. Has he really called me? How valuable am I? How do I measure it? What am I worth? Me, what am I worth? Someone came to me the other day. They said, I just feel like... And, and I, I regarded this person as a very uh, important person in society. And that person was almost in tears and said, I just, day after day, I just question, what am I worth? Am I making any, am I having any effect for good on people? See, these are fundamental issues, psychological issues that affect our psyche, that affect our attitude, that affect our perspective in life. And if these simple issues are dangling and not settled, then we... We just miss the best in life. Am I valuable? What, 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 what? How do I know God is real? Can I touch him? Can I feel him? Can I look at him? How do I know? How, how do I know that God is real? I'm telling you, if preachers tomorrow don't understand this, we can chase around a lot of silly little ideas to make a sermon on and pull up some scripture, you know, from somewhere in the Bible and take it out of context and build us a, a, the, a, a theme. You know. But if we don't know about God, we're in trouble. We can learn to make speeches. We can learn to outline. But when we go out there and meet them, there's going to be devils out there. Them devils are going to still hang around. They've been around a long time. There's a war on all the time. And the people of God are the masters when they know it. They don't know it. Then the devil takes charge and has a, has a, has a camp meeting of his own. And laughs at the church. He don't laugh at me. No. No. Didn't laugh at Daisy. No. She, she, just a woman. Just a woman. A woman. A woman. Wow. A woman. Poor devil. No, he didn't mess with her. See? No. See? What's the proof that he's real? Am I, am I aware is God with me? Is Jesus in me? Do I believe that? Is that real? Is that vivid? When I face the devil, am I aware of that? See, see, these are the issues that will shape tomorrow's preachers. And I'm going to run just fast as I can and try to get to all of them. I'm praying I can get to China. I, I, I want to share them. I've proven these things. And that's why I'm, I'm happy in ministry. That's why. That's why. Only because of what I know. And, uh, and how about his power? How big is it? How, how big do I measure God's power? How is God's power? What is it? Is it? Is it? Is it real? Power. How much? How much can flow through me? What, what do I believe about power? How limited is it?
You know, we have to face it today. I, I, I think it'd be all right for me to say this. I, I sure don't want to hurt anybody. And, and when, when, see, I live my life overseas, and then I come over here, and I come into the church, and I teach, uh, or preach. And uh, if I come over here and, uh, and pop off and say things that I observe because my life is out there, and then I come home, and these things rather uh, surprise me, then, uh, then if I talk about that, then I can hurt people. I don't want to do that. But I, I see a growing tendency, and I don't think it's right, to limit God's power to make somebody fall. If somebody can fall, then the power is there. And that just doesn't impress me at all. No. We do that, we do it because everybody does it. And all the young preachers are learning how to do that. But it, it's always been my theory. It was Bosworth's theory. It was, I don't know, any, any of the ones I studied, the theory was that here come someone in need, you find out what is the need. Okay? That's what you address. But you teach them before you bring them. Our our. Our position was, our, see, we had our traditions too. Everybody has the tradition. It's very hard to not fall into traditions. So ours was, we require, we wouldn't pray for anybody that didn't come three times. That didn't been there three times. And we figured that we ought to be able to get enough truth in them. Then, when they came and we questioned them if they were uncertain, we didn't pray for them. I remember a woman that came every night in the prayer line in Rochester, New York, under our big tent. She came every night for three weeks to be prayed for. She had a blind eye. And, uh, and it was clear to me that she wasn't ready. She, she, she wasn't ready. She, it hadn't clicked. She hadn't, the revelation hadn't come. And every night, I would, I would pass her by and say, my dear, just, just keep listening, keep listening. It'll come to you. Now, I think that's constructive. And then finally, toward the end of that meeting, one night, I said, uh, I said, lady, you've been up here in, in the line so many times. I said, I want to ask you a question. I said, let's forget that awful word, faith. She had told me, says, oh my God, I can never, uh, uh, I, I just can't have that. I said, let's forget that. I said, I want to ask you a question. I said, do you have confidence that God is honest? Oh, yeah. Well, I said, do you think that he is, uh, is fair and that if he makes a statement that he'll back it up? Oh, my God, she said, you've made that so plain. Nobody could doubt that. And I smiled at her. I said, you really believe that? Yeah. I said, my dear, that's what faith is. She said, is that faith? I said, that's what faith is. She says, that faith has scared me to death. If that's it, hallelujah. And I touched Ryan, it was eagle. It was eagle. We dealt with people that way. You say, well, you dealt with people, you're still alive, what do you do now? Well, you try to fit in with the culture of the day and do like people want you to do. They want you to touch them so they can fall. So I accommodate them. Shouldn't I? No, you be religious and say no, come on, come on. You got, you got, to, be, you got to be compatible with people. You can't be a square peg in a round hole. But to a certain degree, you try to lead. So that's what I'm, I'm doing right now. <laughs> I'm sowing a little bit of seed. There is something that works better. But see, in America, I can teach this in Africa. I can, teach, I can teach this in Poland. But not in America. Because in America, we're big 
and were harnessed and were controlled. I shouldn't say controlled. I mean were, were influenced. And television dominates. And, and, and you can't get out and shout and change the course of the river. All you can do is get in the river and flow with it and try to influence it a little bit in a big country like this. I guess that's why I like it better out there, because I can be more frank. I don't have to keep kid gloves on. I can just say it like it is. And they love it. And they do it. They go do it. They go do it. But, hey, we're not second rate. We're doing a good job. If we do it a certain way, it's working. Look at our churches. Look at our nation. Look at the millions of people that are saved and healed and blessed. So, so we can't condemn it. It's working. I'm proud of the church in America. Hallelujah. You believe that? Yeah, yeah. But now, now, look. Today... After he, excuse me, after he, through the Holy Ghost, gave commandment last night, today, to the apostles whom he had chosen, the apostles whom he had chosen, the apostle, right off, that scares people off when they think of the twelve. I don't know exactly about that, but I do know this, that an apostle is a sent one. I don't know whether you'd call me an apostle or not. I'm a sent one. Are you? Are you? In your conviction, in your heart, how do you assess yourself before God? Are you a sent one? I think most of you would agree, would believe that you are. Now, that's nice to agree to, but we have to embrace that and act on that. And that's what is the motivation for our study today. The ones whom he has chosen. Now, that tells me that we are the ones whom he believes in. We are his choice. Can I be frank with you and tell you this morning, I've tried and tried and tried and tried to come up with a term, and maybe you can help me, and uh, I'll use it the next time, that means him as the one who has chosen us. And I thought he's our agent. Yeah, that, I don't like that. That don't sound good. He's our, he's our coach. I don't like that. He's our, he's our, he's our sponsor. Well, that don't quite hit it. What is it? He's the one that chooses us. And he chooses us because he believes in us. Like a coach would pick his team. I don't like coach. Do you? I wouldn't preach good. So I haven't come up with a word that would preach good. you got to have a word that's got a little bit of a holy feel to it, you know, <laughs> or folks won't say it. <laughs> well, that's, that's a little bit of what you call the politics of preaching. You ever hear anyone say that? Yeah, politics of preaching, by that I mean what's palatable to the public, what the public will buy, what they will take. Preachers have to think about things like that. You hadn't thought of that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're public servants. See? <clears throat> okay? Is that hypocrisy? No, no, no. We've got to get along with people because we need them. If we don't have them, we won't go anywhere. We can preach ever so good, but if we don't get somebody's money... We're not ever going to go in there because every time you buy a ticket, you're going to have to pay for it. 
every time you print some your, your books, your tracts, you're going to have to pay for it. We've got to have money. So you've got to hook this thing all together and be broad and be big enough to accommodate the, 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 those peripheral uh, factors involved in successful ministry. A world is ours, and we've got to deal with it. Enough said about that. But he's chosen us. He's chosen us because he picked us out and values us and believes in us that we will do the job. That's the way I think. I'm on his team. I'm on his team because he sized me up and said, that's a good one. I'll take him. Hallelujah. Now, he does that when we embrace what he has provided. He's provided it for everybody. But if we don't embrace it and take it, then he, it isn't that he don't take us. It's that he can't show himself through us if we don't embrace his provision. That's the idea. So, so I feel so good when, uh, when I know I'm chosen of God. I'm chosen because he values me. I'm not going to denigrate my own status with God and contradict what he says about me. I'm not going to demean me when he has redeemed me. No. If he's paid this much to get me on his team, I'm not going to deny him the privilege of my best. That's my feeling. I, I, I ponder, I reflect upon the price that he has paid to be able to induct me into his team. He gave his son for me. He thinks I am worth that. Do I? Am I going to look at the great sacrifice that he has made by giving his only begotten son and Jesus sweating drops of blood and dying on the cross, giving up the ghost, bleeding, dying for me? Am I going to look at that and then demean my status in God and limit me and say, well, I'm, an, you know, I'm not important. I'm a, I'm a nobody. Maybe we wouldn't go that extreme, but I'm, I'm not important, you know. I'm, a, I'm an ordinary person. Oh, I'm, I'm just average. Are you? Can we be average in our world when we are the elect of God whom he has purchased through the blood of his only son. No, no, no. We cannot talk that way. Now, all, most of that kind of talk is a fake humility that is a camouflage for intense pride. Never forget that. People who talk humility, I watch them like nobody's business. Because they are proud people. Watch them or they'll get you. The better posture is to stand up, be yourself, look at the cross, see what God paid, and say, oh, that's the way it is. Okay, I must adjust my thinking, conform my mental image of me to what he says in his word. Accept that, 
live by that, bite the bullet, and go. And forget all this fake humility. It's a bunch of trash anyway. Forget it. Leave it. But they're garbage. Stand up and be who God made you to be. That's not pride. That's true humility. Because that understanding acknowledges that I'm nothing in myself, but I'm everything with him, and I'm everything with him because he has paid for me. And look at me. Hallelujah. Poor devil. Glory to God. I'm in the elite army of our Lord. See? If we don't have that, I'm telling you, we won't go far. We won't go far. Oh, may God, let this come deep in you today. He has chosen us. He values us. Therefore, that demands action. If a coach or an agent or a manager selects a team and their choice, we've just come through the Olympics, and their choice, and there's a lot invested in them. They don't go out there where the contest is and take a nap. Or take it easier and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm not so important. I'm just an average person. Uh, you know, I don't feel like getting out. I, I don't want to flaunt myself out in front of everybody. You know, I'm on. Hey, that won't fly, will it? How many times would you go to the Olympics like that? No, see, that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a crazy, religious, silly idea that's hatched and it proliferates among a lot of people who are swelled up with pride inside, but who are manifesting, trying to fake humility about their position. It's better to just, as I say, uh, straighten up, face the music, see what God said, be that, be that, get it over with, quit fussing about it. How humble you are. How far you go. How much you should have pride. How much bragging you should do. Quit fussing. Forget it. Drop it. Go on and do God's work. What's God's work? Make people better. That other deal is spiritual narcissism. Introversion. Self-attraction. You're carrying a mirror around all the time, looking at yourself to be sure you're holy enough, humble enough, sweet enough. Come on, grow up, get over it, bite the bullet, straighten up, be what you are. Let God's Word reign. Be the one that God has redeemed. And get it over with. And stop the agony. His choice of us demands our action. He hasn't chosen us to be nobodies. He hasn't chosen of us to sit in the gallery. He has chosen us for the arena of action. He has paid for us. His continued ministry depends upon us. He he showed us the way and died for us, expunged our sins, justified us, hallelujah, reconciled us to God, and went home and sat down and said, Father, it's finished. It's done. I've handed it over to them, and now we're here to back them up. And I'll be here all the time to be sure that every time they act, According to my word, we get it done. 
and never stop interceding for them. Never, never, always will be here to mediate. And the Father's police says, that's a good deal. Okay, yeah, yeah, your work's going to be bigger than ever. You was down there alone. You could only walk so many miles in a day. But now, they're everywhere. Oh, God claps his hands and said, ain't that great? It's going to work. It's going to work. And the poor devil's worried. But, but through religion, the devil manages to keep us all humble. Sweet. <clears throat> Come on. Let's grow up. Let's grow up. <clears throat> you believe that? <coughs> Action. <clears throat> His ordination calls for our obedience. He don't order, ordain us to set us on a perch. He ordains us to go and bring forth fruit that our fruit will remain and that we will have power to heal the sick and cast out devils. That's what he ordains us for. Mark 3, 14. You know. We're ordained for action, not for humility. Let me tell you something. You don't have to worry about helping God out about keeping you humble. You understand? God has a thousand ways to handle that. Real nice. Never forget that. You know what God has a problem with? God has a problem getting us to believe we are what he's made us to be. That's the struggle he has. Well, let's draw back from it. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, hallelujah. You know, I'm, 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 I'm one of those in the background. I love that. They're dying to be out on the podium. Because I'm in the background. Wishing to God someone give them a break so they'd get out and be known. I mean, don't listen to that. That's silly. I'm a background person. Don't demean what God has redeemed. His ordination calls for our obedience, action, doing the Word of God, action that produces evidence, action that produces evidence, action that gives proof of our faith. Remember Acts 1 and 8, you shall receive power after the, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You all know, if I was in Poland or if I was in Africa, I would explain this, but you all know that word means virtue, the same virtue that went out of Jesus when he touched the little woman and, and, and her blood uh, uh, flow stopped, you know. Virtue. We, you shall receive this healing, this dynamic, this miracle, virtue, when the Holy Ghost comes upon. Now, a lot of folks, all they got was tongues. They got good at tongues. I would be very disappointed if that's all I got. To be able to talk in tongues. You shall receive virtue. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, my proof producers. At home, the next town, the next country, all the world. Including the segregated part. Thank God we, we, we're not supposed to have any more segregated part. We do. May God save us from bigotry. May God save us from prejudice. May God save us from bias. We talk about God saving us from all of our sins, but he left one of the biggest ones. No, we can't have that. This is for everybody. We can't be like them Jews and Peter. 
They, they wanted it for the Jews, but not for anybody else. They hounded Paul till they finally killed him. Everywhere he'd go, he'd have great meetings and great victories. and had no trouble with the pagans. He's like T.L. Aldrin. Just go, just have a fit everywhere. But these Jews would follow him around. Excuse me, I'm not putting down the Jews. It's just fact. It, it was religious bigotry. The Hebrew, they followed him around, and they would come in and, and, and get stories started on him. Everywhere he went, that was his problem. May God save us from that. One blood, one people, variety, beautiful, we're one, we're equal, everybody. That goes for the genders. There is no difference. There is no difference. Pontificants will always put women in the back, and any of you women that will stay in the back, they'll keep you in the back all of your life. Women have to do, one, I've said this all the time, women have to do it all. They have to do it. You can't stop halfway. They have to do it all. You've got to go win people. You've got to go out there and win people. And here's the good thing about it, women. The laws of the country are just as good for you as they are for men. And that's what just tickles me so, that the, the, the laws are with you. Now, in Paul's day, the laws weren't with the women. The laws were against the women. But, in t but today, the laws are as good for a woman as they are for a man. There's not a single hint, a letter, not a jot or a tittle in the laws of the United States concerning religious liberty that has any inclination of gender. No. Anybody can claim the law. It'll stand up in court. A judge will stand behind you. Lawyers will have to argue your case. And you make it. So, because of that, women have to start at the bottom. They've been kept in the background. They have to start at the bottom. They have to win souls. They have to get them together in classes. They have to teach them. They have to make it, build a church out of them. Then they have to pastor them. Then they have to serve them communion. Then they have to baptize them. Then they have to train them in a Bible training. And then they have to ordain them and send them to the world, they have to go the whole gauntlet because we men like it the way it is and we're not going to move over. The women, men, Many women can go to their graves and be bitter because they want the men to give them a place. No, they're not going to do it. Forget it. Forget it. They're not going to do it. This is 1998. They haven't done it yet. You're going to die waiting on that. They're not going to change. But the laws are for you. You can buy a tent. You can rent a building. You can build a church. You can do any... And listen, <laughs> and listen, listen, but just a little bit more. And when you buy your tent and make your converts, build your church, build your Bible school, that's people, 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 people. That's money, money, money. And then all the men will be on your side. Yeah. That's just the way it is, my dear. It's not easy. Hasn't been easy for us men. Here's the sad thing, then, when the women go out and do it, and they pull a boo-boo, everyone mocks them. But, oh, my Lord, if we would analyze the boo-boos pulled by the men, wouldn't that be shameful? I tell you, there's been some corkers in just my gener just in my lifetime. <laughs> if I could tell you all the ones that have come and went, arose and fallen, started and quit, preached and turned to politics or to business. Don't blame the women when they pull a boo boo. They've got to have practice. They learn. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad I threw that in? I'm, I'm talking about He's chosen us. Women! Who's your example? Women! What impact has Jesus made on you? Women! Has He called you? Are you sure? Did it come through a man? 
It couldn't be from God if it didn't come through a man. Come on, grow up! Grow up! For heaven's sake, grow up! God is a communicator. What's the Holy Ghost in you for? Are you valuable? Just to make biscuits? You got a womb? What about your head? You got a brain? Yeah, hallelujah. What proof do you have that God is real? You, a woman, how do you know? Oh, your husband knows, or the man knows, yeah, he's got good proof, God bless him. How about you? You got proof? You bet. You bet. And are you aware? Are you aware of the presence of Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, Master in your life? Are you aware of Him? Of His presence? And who can you be afraid of? And how about your power? How big is it? Glory to God. I had to throw a little bit in for you women. I always have to preach some for the women. I'm a believer in people. People. Hallelujah. You shall receive virtue to produce proof of the resurrection message. That's what we're all about. We receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon us to be able to go out and speak and pray and produce proof that Jesus, our Lord, is not like Muhammad, that he is risen from the dead. Hallelujah. We can produce the proof. That's what the Holy Ghost is for. That's what he comes to us for. He comes. Jesus sent him. The Father sent him to us to give us everything that the Father had put in his Son so that we could be qualified to continue what his Son showed us how to do. That's Christianity. That's Christian ministry. That's miracle. That's miracle life. That's miracle ministry. It's terrific. You got the picture? Yeah. We must remember that without the miraculous, Christianity is a religion. It's all there is to it. No different than Islam. Success depends on action. Action in his choices. He chose me to do his work through me. Now, consequently, I count in God's plan. I am vital to God's plan. Do you know what the psychologists tell you? They tell you that the greatest motivation in life is to have a sense of importance, of purpose, of worthy purpose. Isn't that simple? Isn't that ABC? And they make so much money on that. Just tell them people that. And they just flutter in and flutter out and feel so good after paying them $100, but they told them they're important. See, the gospel has all of this. We have, we have the core of what makes people. Do you understand why presidents love us? Why commissioners love us? Why we're, we've been friends with so many presidents and leaders of nations? They like what we teach their people. I mean, a lot of preachers just come and they, they lay over the air and, and make a lot of noise and give a lot of condemnation to people and tell them where they're going to hell and, you know, and all that stuff. We build people. We build a nation. We build nations. We tell people these things. I think that is gospel. The only thing we're commanded to preach is gospel. What is gospel? It's four things. It's God's creation. 
It is Satan's deception. It is Christ's substitution. It is our restoration. The world does not know that they are the creation of God. And they do not know that God so believes in them that he paid a supreme price to save them from falling when they did everything against him. The world don't know that. When they get that picture, they begin to understand, wow, is that true about that big God up there? Really? Yeah. Well, then, and then it begins to affect them. Oh, then that, that gives me a reason for living. And that's why so many preachers come out of our meetings over there. It, preachers, I don't like to say preachers, I should say ministers, people, because, because they get this, they get this, Pastor LaDonna calls it, and she's writing a book on it, the big picture, the big picture. See, if you get this big picture, see, I said the big picture, uh, God's creation, Satan's deception in the garden, and then Christ's substitution, and our restoration. Now, that's all there is to it. We've got a big Bible. That's all there is to it. But pe religion chews that up and squashes it out in so many forms and, and, and so many mysteries that the world is scared. And they're saying, oh, if there's a God up there, I'd like to believe in you. But religion's got me scared of you. I don't know which bunch to run with. If they run with this one, they want me to vote against somebody else. And I'm kind. I don't want to be against somebody. I'd like to know you're real. That's where the world is. But we, we've scared them. Preachers have scared them. It's a simple picture. God believes in us. That's our theme today. He chose us. He wants us because he can't do his work without us. That's his plan. That's his plan. That was his dream. That was, okay, if you can figure that out, you say, oh, come on, God. Go. Okay, figure this out. Why did God create people to start with? Did he have to? No, he didn't have to. He did. Why? Silly? I don't know. Had a dumb idea? Didn't work? They turned against him? Silly? No. God had an idea. Well, he still got that idea. He wants people. God loves me. God believes in me. God works through me. God lives in me. God has chosen me. He's happy. I'm happy. He made people, nice people, and made a garden and put them in. That's why I grow roses. <laughs> Took me a long time after Daisy died to grow roses. God dealt with me. <clears throat> what good's a rose without love? What good's a violin without, without strings? <clears throat> God loves us. God had this idea. And he's chosen us. We're his choice. I read it yesterday. As thou sent me, John 17, 18, as thou sent me, even so I send them. My Father sent me, I send you. Go ye, go ye into all the world. God so loved the world. Our ministry, your ministry, has world proportions. Our action is vital to our hurting world. If we don't do it, God can't do it. Because he has chosen us to do it through. Young people, old people, everybody. You believe it? <coughs> I'm going to... I'm going to... I want to share something with you, and then we'll take a break before we go into the next session. <clears throat> I was talking about we, 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 we went beyond what was customary. You, this will shock you. You're looking at the first person 
who ever went to a non-Christian nation out on an open field and announced to these pagan people or heathen people or unbelieving non-Christian people, announced in the papers, announced with flyers to come together and hear the foreign preacher talk about God and get up and propose to them this. I'm going to tell you about this God that is uh, described in this little black book that I carry. I'm going to tell you about his son, Jesus. And then uh, explain to them the way Jesus lived and what he did. Uh, this, 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 is our, this is our proposition on the opening night of every crusade we conduct. And I take them through that Bible and, and I tell them the things that Jesus did. The signs and the miracles and the wonders that he did. And the way he loved people and was kind to people. And then present the proposition and say, now, I have come because according to this book, he's the only Savior that can save anybody. He's the only way to go to heaven and be with God, this God of love. So, he loves you. He wants you to believe in him. This God that this book talks about wants you to have faith in him. That's what I tell him. Now, he wants you to accept him. He wants to save you. He wants to bless you. He wants to come to you. He wants to do the same things that he did. Because I always tell them about how they finally killed him. Religious people killed him. And then he rose from the dead. And, he, and, he, and, and then he sent us to tell everybody that if they just believe on him, he'd do the same things today. Now, that's what I tell every crowd on opening night. You come with me to the next campaign, that's what you'll hear me preach. What's more fundamental? What else could you preach to a non-Christian crowd on an opening night? What else could you say? That's the issue. Tell them about Jesus, what he did, who he is, where he came from, and how people killed him, and then how he rose, and how now he comes back and he has a passion for people and a love for people. And I tell them, now, 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 so according to this, as God's servant, I've come to you as a messenger, and I'm supposed to ask you to believe on him. But I don't know whether you believe on him or not. You can't just take my word for it. I'm a foreigner to you. I speak the wrong language. My skin's the wrong color. I'm from the wrong country. I lay that out to them. I say, how could I ask you to believe me? Would you trade your religion for my religion just because me, a foreigner, would come over here and get up on this platform and tell you all these things? How do we know they're true? Now, that's the way I approach it. That seemed logical to me when I had been to India and failed and came home brokenhearted and saw Brother Brown and saw those miracles and those voices said, that you can do. That's what Jesus did. That's what Paul did. That proves the Bible way is still for today. That, that was logical to me. I wasn't very smart, but I was smart enough to figure that's the way it's supposed to be. Now, that consumed me. So that's what I tell them. Now I say, now, so, 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 we got, we got to find out if this that I'm saying is true or not. How are we going to know? I don't want to ask you to claim to believe on this Jesus that I come preaching to you about if you don't, if you don't, if you don't have some proof. To this day, I don't understand how the churches that don't believe in miracles expect to convert non-Christians. I don't know how. But they do it, and thank God they convert a few. They've converted quite a few down through the years. It's wonderful. I don't understand their theory. They can read all that to their people and then say, no, he don't do that today, but he's good servant. No, none of that's for you, but he's good servant. It seems silly. I don't want to base my ministry like that. 
So I tell them, I, I'll tell you what, I, I, say, I always tell them, I say, I want to pray for you. I want to pray to this God. This book talks about prayer. It says, I can pray to God and God will answer. That's what that book says. I'm out here preaching that book. I believe that book. I believe what's in the, I believe that's from God. I tell them, I'm, I want to pray to this God. And I want to ask this God to come among you and do things. Like he did in the Bible. And, and if he will, and then if people out there, I don't know you. I don't know, I don't know nothing about you. But if God will come and do some wonderful things for you, and then if, if, if that happens to some of you, will you be kind enough to come up here and share it with the public so they could know about it? Because they won't know about it out there. I always just labor that. Take 20 or 30 minutes to work through that, to get their logistics with me. That's why these, these meetings are so profound on a country. And, and they, they'll agree, yeah, they'd come up, you know, if, if something happened. And then you pray. And never in 55 years has it failed. You see, some, no, no. I started out by saying, you're looking at the first person that ever did that. Did you realize that? I'm the first. I'm not bragging, trying to be the first. I, no, I didn't know anything about being the first. That was of no concern to me. It's been the last few years I realized, good heavens, I'm the first one that ever did that. I was shocked. Spent my life doing it. I never realized we was the first. I got to thinking one day, why in the world didn't Amy McPherson do that? Why did she stay here in America? She had been to China. She knew those poor pagan people out there. How could she, with all that power, have stayed here in America and never gone back and told them? Now, I don't say that to accuse Amy. I'm saying it's just a total... It, it, it baffled me when I had that thought. My heaven, how could she not have? Well, she didn't. It's all right. God bless her. Then I got to think about Wigglesworth. Why didn't he? With all that power... We brag about the power, all the miracles. Why didn't he go to Africa? Why didn't he go to India? Why didn't he go out there? He didn't. Well, what about Charles Price? What about Dowie? Dowie, noted one of the greatest prophet preachers in the history of America, Australian, came here. Aust Did you hear I said Australian? He came from Australia. That means he came, well, uh, that was 1890, wasn't it, when he came over here? Uh, was, was the Suez Canal open yet? Anyone know when the Suez Canal was open? No? You're dumb with me. I, I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't know. But anyhow, if it wasn't open, then he had to sail around the Cape of Africa all that way. And in those days, those boats had to stop at ports to get more coal or get more wood, you had to know. If the Suez Canal was open, then he had to come through that way, and there was Egypt, and there was, there was Portugal, and there was Morocco. They had to stop at those ports. He knew about these poor people in the world. Besides, they had to come up from Australia, up through Indonesia, up through those, or I mean, up through in between Singapore and around Ceylon. It was then Ceylon, Sri Lanka now. And in, he had to know about the world. How could he have come over here to America and stay with all that power? Power. I don't understand that. I don't say that to imply condemnation on him. It's his life, none of my business. But I have got a right to question. Why didn't he do it? Why in the world did I feel I had to? I took my precious little wife, and maybe she went to heaven a little earlier because we worked so hard. I mean, that woman carried this whole thing. She went before me. She set up all those campaigns. She worked with the government. She worked with the preachers. She worked with the press. Oh, you don't know what that woman... I've just finished a book about her. You'll be getting it. It's a great book, 300 pages, and it's going to be a great book, and I, I hope every one of you can get it. But, uh, but uh, 
Why did we? I, I've stood out there. I've stood out there at the grave and looked at that. I put some of this story in the book. I've stood there at that uh, that monument. You know that that stone that we put there, and, uh, and we, we we chose a, a scripture. We put across it. We have preached righteousness to the great congregations. We have uh, proclaimed thy salvation to the nations as an epitaph for both of us. And after she's gone, I'd stand up there and I'd cry. I'd look at that and I'd get mad. I'd say, what good did you do that? Yeah. You went and went and went. <clears throat> you went and went and went. What? For what? There are more unsaved people than there were. What good did it do, darling, that you worked so hard? So, why us? That's my point. Why us? Why did we go do that? The first to do it. Why didn't these other preachers do that? They're good people. I'm not condemning them. I'm just saying, why me? I didn't have to, but I did. And I figured that out. I thought I'd get up there and I'd tell, after I went to India and saw those masses, come home, saw that man. Well, I thought, hey, we could go out there and we could do that and get up there and pray for them people and then we could make converts. And Hindus would believe then. Yeah. Why us? We spent our whole life. And you know what we did? Did I cut short that story? No, I didn't. About the first night. I finished that, didn't I? Pray for him. And God always answers. I said that, didn't I? Yeah. I, 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 I didn't leave that hanging. <laughs> so, you know, you get three or four stories going, and you leave one hanging. But anyhow, 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 God always answers, always answers, always answers. Oh, why? Now I remember where I cut off. Because God's sitting up there saying, whoopee, go for it, T. Oh, yeah, that's what I want. Whoop. Yeah. See? See? The church said to us, do you know? You'd be surprised which main denomination. They rejected us. They notified their missionaries they could not cooperate with us. Now this is this is a shame. But I don't fuss about it. I don't advertise this. Haven't written this. Don't tell it. But once in a while, like this, intimately, uh, he said he's tempting God, and we don't want to be a part of it. Now that was their posture. Besides, they said. He's, 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 done, he's learned some trick about the camera and is manipulating the negative. Nobody, nobody in no country, in heathen countries, heathen people don't come by great crowds to hear the gospel. They never did before. Sidney Carell, one of the greatest voices in the fundamental uh, evangelical world at Wheaton, Illinois, sent me a letter when that Java crusade came and said, who would have ever dreamed of 10,000 Muslims and Hindus coming out in a public field to hear the gospel? He was stunned. It was stunning. Daisy and me have changed the world. We didn't, that wasn't what we tried to do. We just looked at that, got the idea, realized he was depending on us, and we went and did it. We changed the world. Now, and Sidney said, after 10,000, said, let alone 50,000 or 100,000. I have his letter. said, it's uncanny. It's unheard of. It was unheard of. And here the denominations fighting us because they're saying we was tricking with the camera, faking the pictures. And besides, the way he gets up there so smart alecky and prays to God for a miracle. And if a miracle, because I always tell him, I say, now, now look, if nothing happens when I pray to this God, then it'll prove this book's not true and we can burn it. And all these preachers, you can go burn their churches and they can all, you can run them out of town. Now, that'll, that'll get the preachers with you. That'll get the preachers with you. 
I caught on to that. That'll get the preachers with you. See, you need the preachers with you. That'll do it. <laughs> and that's what they said about us. And it took it took several years before they changed. And now they've forgotten they ever said that. Now they invite me to their headquarters. They love me to come. They, they, the, the new generation has forgotten they were against me because I never fussed back. If you're going to fight and have war, then the, that'll go down in history. Come on. Uh, life's worth too much for that. Yeah. We're busy. We're happy making people better. Who cares if they don't believe? Well, we wish they believe, but if they don't, that's their problem. But we're busy. The world is hungry and needs us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So here's what I want to tell you before we break. There was a passion in, in Daisy and me. Because this was dynamite. This was dynamite. You mean you could go out on a field brazen like that and tempt God and tell those heathen pagan people and pray for God to do a miracle. And if he didn't, say God isn't alive. Is that any different than Elijah did? I don't compare myself to Elijah, but I'm saying the idea is the same. If our God is real, let it be shown. That's why he sent Jesus. That's why the Apostle Paul and Peter and John and those preachers preached like they preached. If they had not had miracles, they'd have been killed. If they had miracles. That they had miracles. That's a silly term. It's not a good term. God confirmed that. We don't have miracles in our pockets. But if we preach truth, God has agreed to confirm it. I believe that. So, so because everywhere it, it spread pretty fast. And, and both fear and hope spread in the wake of these reports. Some missionaries, it gave them hope. Oh, if we could have that here. And some scared the fire out of them. And they started bracing to do everything to keep that fanaticism out of their country. And we, Daisy and I, I don't know why. Maybe it was, maybe it was God's purpose for us. It was a passion to us. If anywhere in any country they said this won't work, we went there. That was our call. And listen, they said it almost everywhere. Jamaica? Wonderful. They said, ah, it's because they speak English. They're close to America. Cuba. It won't work here. It's Catholic. Work. Ah, they said it's because they're so close to America. I don't know why the world blames America for everything. But they did. Puerto Rico. It worked. Actually, we went to Puerto Rico first. Catholic. They said it won't work here. But it did. They said, well, it's because it's part of America. Then Cuba. Oh, Cuba, it won't work. But it did. Then they said it's because it, it's Catholic, but it's so close to America. Then they said, don't come to South America. They won't work. They'll kill you down here. Back in those days, excuse me, I don't like to say this. It's a part of history I'm ashamed to even record. But the Catholics were mean. They were fanatical. They ruled. And uh, some things still not so hot. <laughs> down there. I can tell you some current stories. Anyhow, we don't like to because we're, we're trying to, you know, let's gain a little. Let's grow up a little. Amen. But, uh, but, but they said it won't work in South America. They'll kill you. They'll never. Live. Went to, to Barquisimeto in Venezuela. And beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, they arrested us and they stopped us and they crammed us in a big church, in a, in a little bitty church in a big compound. They wouldn't let us go to sell. The meanest thing. You can't believe what all they did to it. Anyhow, but night after night after night, the streets filled. The police were there. Everything. It worked. It was the same. They didn't kill us. Hallelujah. <laughs> wonderful thing. Wonderful thing. And then, then 
then, you know, and all up through Central America, and almost everywhere we went, they stopped us and shut us down, and our money was spent, and we were flabbergasted, and they arrested and all that stuff. But anyhow, anyhow, it worked every time. It worked every time. It worked every time. It worked in Costa Rica. It worked in Panama. It worked in El Salvador. It worked in Nicaragua. It worked in Guatemala. Hallelujah. It worked. But then they got scared across the Pacific. It'll never work over here. The east is west. The west is west. Never the plain shall meet and all that stuff. You know, Japan, no. And some of the Japanese missionaries was scared to death we was coming. They said, we don't need that superstition over here. Said, we've got to have, we've got to have academics to win the Japanese. We don't want healing over here. They've got their own healers. Yeah, not like us. I know, I've been there. We went to the seat of Shintoism, Kyoto, Japan, almost under the shadow of the greatest Shinto's temples in Japan for three weeks out on a field, those precious Japanese by the thousands, 44 deaf mutes were healed in one meeting, in that one crusade. 44 deaf mutes. They don't have any healers in Japan that can make a deaf mute here and talk. <laughs> they got healers, not like us. They don't have anyone that can make blind eyes open. We did. God did. I mean, our gospel did. Hallelujah. They don't have any healers that, that can cut casts off of people whose backs are broken and they can walk and jump and play. But it happened in a meeting. The Japanese were just like a bunch of Mexicans, just, as just like a bunch of Americans, just as happy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And they say, oh, they're so stoic. Oh, they're so... Wherever we'd hear, the, the Shinto, it won't work. Yeah, it worked. And they said, well, it won't work among the Confucius. I said, sure enough. And boy, here we went to Taiwan. Because uh, we could get in there, we couldn't get in China. So we'd get in, in Taiwan. Gaoxiu, Tainan, three cities. What was the other? Great crowds of people. I never saw so many miracles. I'm telling you, the Chinese are the most beautiful people in the world. And they shout, and they cry, and they dance, and they jump, and they get healed just the same. It's shaking, it was shaking the missionaries' empires of the world. Shaking them. Because they go out there. We went to India. I wanted to put up a... I wanted to put up a bush arbor. We were evangelists. We had musical instruments. We sang together. I said, I said, we'll cut poles. I, I, I'm in Oklahoma. I know what an arbor is. We'll cut poles, put them in the ground. Out there we can get bamboo. That's, that's easy. We get coconut leaves. That's better than blackjack stuff. That stuff's terrible. But coconut leaves and, and make us, that's what we was going to do. They wouldn't let us. The missionaries would have left. The missionaries would have left. Well, they were giving us a little allowance every month, so I couldn't go against them. You know what they had me doing? That's all they would let me do. That missionary had rented a little store that had 16 chairs in it. That's how little it was. That was his mission. He preached there once a week, Sunday morning. He would let me go down there in the little blackboard in the window and I could write the name of his sermon. That was my weekly mission. I'm an effective evangelist. We were in biggest churches in our organization. That's what they did to us. Well, we couldn't stand that. So we tried to break out of that and finally did get loose from that and went to another bunch that was Pentecost Church God. We went to the Assembly of God down in Lucknow and thank God for them. They were so kind. Carl Butler and his wife, so precious. They did receive us to have a revival. Well, they had a store about, they had about 40 chairs. He preached there once a week. He cautioned me. He told me, said, Brother Aldrin, you don't win souls in India like you do in America. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta forget that. He says, I have been in India. I'm going on my second five year term. I've never won a soul. A 
So I told him. Kind, consoling. That didn't satisfy us. So when he let us preach, it was with un, it was on condition that I not make an altar call. How would you like that? Young people, you bump into a lot of things out there. Okay. We was living in their house. We didn't have any money. They were feeding us. I didn't have any choice. You got to find out how to get money. If you don't have money, you don't have a ministry. That's really why we came home. We had to find a way to get some money. They give us a little stipend, a little mission stipend. God bless them. Thank them. I thank the Pentecost Church God. They were good to us. They were kind. I don't, no reflection on them. They're doing the, it was the epoch of the time. All denom, hey, you ought to see some of the fundamental uh, denomination. Pitiful, pitiful. This guy that had a chair, about 40 chairs, he sold insurance all week and bragged he was making over $600 a month just selling insurance. Preaching once a week. Allow no altar call, never one a soul, Pentecostal mission. Now that, that, that's what we were birthed in. Said you can't make an altar call. We don't do that in India. I don't want you to do that. Okay, I didn't. We preached for, I think it was two weeks. Might have been three. We preached as long as we could. <laughs> you know, we needed any place to do anything. And I groaned every night, oh boy, I was an old-fashioned Pentecostal preacher that made altar calls and got people saved. We prayed for the sick every Thursday, every Friday night. Don't ask me why we didn't do it on Thursday night. Friday night was the night. <laughs> Friday night, that was our tradition. See, young people, everybody grows traditions. And, and it's tough stepping out of line. You get in trouble. <laughs> so you got a, you got a little politics, you know. <laughs> so, okay, forget that last statement. <laughs> okay, but anyhow, anyhow, I, 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 I agonized through that. And the last night, me and Daisy, we, we parleyed and we decided, live or die, sink or swim. We got to do something. That last night I caught him off guard. I made an altar call. Eleven Hindus came forward and knelt. It so shocked him. His face flushed. He paced back and forth. Daisy and I got down in the middle of them and prayed just loud as we could, just, just hollered and prayed, just made all the noise we could to make all the confusion. And the secretary, church secretary, sat back there praying, oh God, control it, control it, control it. <laughs> They'd never seen anything like that in their life. Their life. And, and we just hollered and prayed, and, and, and we just shouted him out of the place. And he went home mad. Our host. Hallelujah, 11 Hindus got saved. Well, it could have been every night that way. We'd had to move outside. They'd let me build that arbor. We'd had people saved. Oh, boy, we'd have had a great time. I had to get out of there. And, and, and we got home. Oh, boy. The fat was in the fire. He said, and his wife was, 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 was she, she knew he was mad. And uh, she was, uh, she's a wonderful woman. And she was trying to talk logic to him. And, and when we came in, she was saying, honey, they proved that it'll work in America, like, that it'll work in India like it does in America. He was mad. He wouldn't comment. Isn't that too bad? Claim to be Holy Ghost filled. Mad because we got 11 people saved. Pentecostal. Now, now, that's the way the world was. And an awful lot of the missionaries were like that. And that's what we came into. And now imagine us going to those kind of people. I can tell you the same story in Guatemala. I can tell you the same story in Chile. The Chile missionary, he went golfing. He wouldn't come to the crusade, refused to come to the crusade. He golfed every day. Guatemala, that missionary had a beautiful compound. Never, he bragged, never had a Guatemalteco been inside his guard, his yard. Never, never. He goes outside 
to talk to them. All over the world it was that way. Bigotry, prejudice. Me and Daisy have changed the world. I'm telling you, we've changed the world. And you young people coming on, you don't even realize what it was like then. And thank God you won't have to realize. However, keep your eyes open. You'll find a lot of the pockets of it still out there. But, but that's all right. We're winning. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We've changed policy. We've changed evangelism thinking. It's changed. And we spent our life. We went to uh, Taiwan. Same there. Same. Boy, it's wonderful how those, 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 uh, those Confucius believe. Beautiful people. And then Indonesia. Muslim. He said, work for the Shintos. Work for the Confucius, but not the Muslims. He said, here we come. <laughs> here we come. I'm telling you, it was a passion. God must have raised us up to break those codes. Who else cared? Nobody else cared. Why didn't Amy do it? Why didn't Wigglesworth do it? Why didn't Dowie do it? I don't know. God bless them. They answered to God. He's their master. None of my business. It's just an honest question on my part. I don't know how, having that power, they couldn't take it out there and share it with those poor people. That's the way I felt. That's the way Daisy felt. She gave her life for that. Would the Muslims believe it? We went to Indonesia, and there was that great Java Harvest crusade on the Malia Bands. No, no, that was Holland. No, <clears throat> On the, on the La Pangan Bunting, the big field there. And we went out on it, and it was dangerous. The preachers didn't want to go there because they said the Muslims had rioted three weeks before and had killed about seven Christians right there on that ground. I mean, this was Indonesia in the early days. In 400 years of Indonesian history, they had never had a gospel meeting in the open air. The Dutch had ruled Holland, had ruled the Hollanders had ruled Indonesia for 400 years. It was the Netherlands East Indies. That's what they called it back then. On your old maps, you'll see it like that. And in 400 years, they had never had a gospel meeting. But Su 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 Sukarno, uh, the, the president, had risen up uh, at the, uh, right following the, the Second World War and had claimed independence and driven out the Dutch, the Hollanders, back to Holland, and he declared liberty, freedom, and we got in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So they couldn't stop us. And so we went to the Lapangan Banting, and there we were for, for four weeks, day after day after day after day. But here's the, here's the story on that, that we were called in the second day because the crowd was so big, we were called in by the Attorney General, and he was really up in arms and called me in for questioning. I sat there for three hours being questioned, drilled, grilled. Stayed sweet. But what was beautiful about the Indonesian people, they didn't stop our campaign while they investigated. Those South Americans, they just shut you down and quit. They don't care nothing. Excuse me. The priest rules down there, not law. Some places it's still like that. It was awful. Law was nothing, is what the priest wanted. I could tell you so many stories. Anyhow, but oh, I was so proud of the Indonesian because they were democratic. They didn't stop us. They let me go night and preach, but then I'd have to come in. And for four days, I had to go in before that attorney general. Oh, boy, that was a grueling thing. I just hung in there, just answered him honestly. And I just got to preach him so much gospel that it was amazing. <laughs> Every question he asked was another open door. And, 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 and when it was all through, he stood up, shook my hand. He said, well, Reverend Osborne, you may continue your crusade on one condition. You may not speak one word directly or indirectly. Now, that indirectly is what really gets, gets close. Nor indirectly against or about any other religion. Did you hear that? Not direct or indirect, even about any other religion. I straightened up and smiled. 
I said, sir, I would to God that every Christian preacher in the world were obliged to obey your ultimate with pleasure. Thank you. I will preach my Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and the rest is history. Indonesia changed. Tens of thousands of churches, millions upon millions of Christians, one of the strongest Christian nations in the world is Indonesia. I'm so full. Let's take a break. Five minutes or ten minutes, something like that, and come back, and then we'll, and then we'll take this next hour and have some fun. Uh, this is my introduction. I've got a good sermon up here. I'm going to give you. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is this too much? This three hours. This too much? You normally have this. Three hours? Okay. Okay. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. I, I understand that Mother Teresa said, uh, maybe, I, maybe I should say we're beginning this next session on uh, the Christ connection. And we're talking today about uh, Christ having chosen us because he believes in us. He has redeemed us so he believes that we are the ones that can carry on his ministry. He gave commandment to the apostles whom he had chosen. Apostles sent ones. Sent ones. Don't let that big word scare you. Sent ones. Hallelujah. <clears throat> He came back from the dead and gave these commandments to the ones that came and he revealed himself to. And that was many, many people, including women. And so, uh, so I, uh, I, I think we ought, to, we ought to keep that in perspective. Now, uh, th this study concerns the miracle life of Jesus the miracle ministry of Jesus. God's will is that Jesus came and showed us how, then paid for our sins, came back from the dead, sent the Holy Spirit back to us. He could send the Holy Spirit back to us because he had redeemed us from our sins by his blood and justified us and reconciled us to God so that we are brought back into the presence of God with nothing left standing against us. The only condition is that we never stop trusting Him for our justification, for our salvation. He has accomplished this for us. Having redeemed us, He could come and live in us. Before He redeemed us, He couldn't live in people. He had only one body to minister through during his life and ministry. His desire, God's desire was, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And now he has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. So that, as, so that it is as though God did beseech people by us to be reconciled to God. That's a powerful scripture, isn't it? In 2 Corinthians there, chapter 5. Wonderful, wonderful truth. And so, so having redeemed us, uh, uh, he, can, he can come into us. And by coming into us, he has more than one body then. Well, we all are members together of one body. It is one body in that sense. But each one of them, each one of us are his body. To get, help people get that clear, I often say, suppose you were the only person in the whole world who ever believed on Jesus Christ. Would he have died for you? The answer is yes. God made the decision he would die for the world and whoever would believe would be saved. So if only you were the only one that ever believed this gospel story, 
it would have been just as valid for you. And Jesus Christ, at your invitation, would have come into you and lived in you. You'd be the only one in the world. Would you be the body of Christ? Yeah, see. See, see. it has to be individual. We talk about the collective body of Christ, the corporate body of Christ. And we, we who are afraid of someone getting too proud about their holiness, we keep it clear that we all are the body of Christ. But it's like salvation. Yes, we're all saved. But if each one is not individually saved, it's not real. I am the body of Christ. Christ lives in me. I am built for the habitation of God. See, just like I am saved. Yes, we're all saved, but I am saved. If none of you are saved, I am saved. See, it's important. Everything with God through faith has to be individual. You know that. They tell me that Mother Teresa, as a young lady, when she set out, she talked about her ideas that she wanted to do, and they laughed at her. First, because she was a woman, and second, because she had no money. She was a poor lady. That's the way I understand the story. And she told them, I've got two pennies. And with God and two pennies, you can do anything. I believe that. Now that's the kind of stuff that we've got to be made out of in order to carry out the work that God has called us to do. <clears throat> I was a farmer boy, grew up up around Skidi, Oklahoma, Manford and Skidi, and uh, all I ever knew was farming. I got saved. Wonderfully saved. And filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm sure I didn't know much about what it meant. But I got the experience. And it was a joyful and a happy experience. And at 16, I went with Ernest Dillard. We went across to Arkansas and quite a bit of eastern Oklahoma. And finally he took me to California. And in California, at Almo, California, that's uh, east of Los Banos, some young people came over from the Los Banos church and Daisy was one of them. And I saw her and I knew that was a good thing. And, and so we were married and we, and we went to the world. We went to the world. We, uh, we, uh, during, uh, we were married, came back to Oklahoma, traded our car on a cab for a, mod for a Model A Ford, fixed the Ford, drove it back to California, sold it, and then I got a job, because I was desperate for some money, but Ernest Dillard found us again. I was working at a filling station, and he didn't like that. And he, they opened the church. He had a church at that time, over in uh, Campbell, California, near San Jose, and he invited us to come preach the revival. I wasn't much of a preacher. He, he made me preach. He taught me to preach. God bless Ernest Dillard. Every Friday night, he'd make me preach. He'd say, you either preach or turn white and sit down. <laughs> well, I, I probably turned white. I don't know if I preached. But I didn't sit down. And I got to liken it. Hallelujah. God bless Ernest Dillard. He made me preach. Isn't it wonderful? How, you know, never forget to take young people under your arms. Encourage them. Encourage them. Don't look down on them. Don't condemn them. They're young. They got, give them a chance to learn and to boo-boo, to make mistakes and grow. Hallelujah. And that, that's what he did to me. And there I was back working at a filling station. Had to have a little bit of money. We were married. And, and he didn't like that. And he opened his church. And we went there and we preached a three-week revival. We preached for three weeks. Lord only knows what I preached, but we preached. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> we preached and, 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 uh, and survived. And all up and down California in church revivals. And then the bigger churches got to, got to call on us. 
One big church. We were five weeks. Five weeks. Think of that. Five weeks every night. I, I remember 53 souls got saved. That was the news of the whole country back then. 53 souls got saved in those five weeks. Wonderful. Now, nobody got people saved like that. Almost nobody. We were popular. Everybody wanted us. That was the church where that one old sinner boy came every night for five, <laughs> for five weeks trying to get saved and couldn't get saved. We couldn't get God interested in him. <laughs> I don't know what we preached. I don't know what we prayed. I got down there and prayed my head off every night with that guy. I wanted that sinner to get saved, but God didn't want to save him. God wasn't interested in him. Finally, the last night, I lucked out and found out how to help him. And I said, Don't, your prayers aren't any good. Mine aren't any good. You say what I say. And I, the idea struck me to say scriptures. And I said about three scriptures about salvation. He took off and was saying, hallelujah. But see how God uses you. You start where you are and you do everything you can do. And you keep pressing forward and God will bless you. I saved at 12 Started preaching at 15, married at 18, we were a missionary in India at 21. And we were in mass evangelism at the age of 24. Isn't that wonderful? Why? Action! Action! To do what we could. God believed in us. I had to learn that. You got to see yourself chosen of God. See yourself sent forth by Him. He needs you to go give his message. He has no other way of getting his message out to people. He's not going to send angels. He's not going to send the Holy Spirit to move on people and do it for you. <clears throat> I know a soul winner, a great man of prayer, a good man, a good teacher, a wonderful, he's a Methodist. He was called <clears throat> up here to Pahuska to, uh, to uh, a ladies, Methodist ladies group. Uh, he was in the area preaching and wanted him to come up and, uh, and speak for them. Uh, Harry Denman. If you're Methodist background, he's the greatest name currently in Methodism evangelism. He was the secretary of, of uh, evangelism for the United Methodist Church for 25 years. And is a great man, but simple, precious, precious, wise, dynamic, simple, simple. He went to this ladies' meeting, and uh, when he walked in the door, he heard some of the ladies talking secretly about a certain woman that had fallen in sin and was in trouble, and, and they were concerned about her. And so when he went up to, uh, they introduced him, and he started to speak. He said, uh, he's a funny old guy. Real old and kind of growled for a voice. He didn't have much of a voice, but precious. He said, I heard you talking about that woman that's fallen in sin. Yes. He said, well, what are, you doing? what are you doing about it? And they said, well, we're, we're praying. He said, ain't you doing any more than praying? And, and, and the lady, the leader of the group stood up and said, Brother, Brother Denman, said, we're calling her name in prayer every time we meet. And he just leaned over the pulpit and kind of growled at him and said, Good, she'll go to hell while you do that. Ain't you going to do anything more than that? Ain't you been to her? Nobody been to her? Ain't you rescued her? Gone to her? Said, Ain't anybody said anything to her? He just growled at him. She'll go to hell while you sit here and pray. You know, we need to realize that. God's not going to trot around as our messenger boy and fix things up for us while we sit on our duff and do nothing. I believe in prayer. I'm a believer in prayer, but I'm a believer in action. Just threw that in for good measure. See yourself sent of God. You don't send God. Oh, Lord, send your spirit across. No. You don't have any Bible for that. He sat down. Hallelujah. I want to read you something in Isaiah chapter 50, 49. Now, listen. The theological interpretation of Isaiah 
49 is that this is a prophecy about Jesus. So for all these generations, the theologians have taught us this wonderful chapter and have given it all to Jesus and missed the whole idea. Yes, it's a prophecy about Jesus, but where is Jesus now? In me. He lives in me. He ministers in me. He talks through me. He witnesses through me. He heals through me. He speaks through me. This Jesus, of whom Isaiah prophesied, is in me. Now, let's see what the Holy Ghost moving upon Isaiah said about the Jesus who lives in you. Therefore, about you. Aren't you glad I told you that so you won't miss this wonderful chapter? Now I'm going to read you these statements. Let me, let me confess something. I'm going to read them out of the Living Bible. This is when that chapter came to came to life to me, the 49th chapter of Isaiah, in reading the Living Bible. I'm sorry I didn't perceive it in reading King James, but uh, I, I have sort of an aversion to those complicated terms, and, and sometimes I miss good stuff. When I found these things in the Living Bible, I was so flabbergasted at what the Holy Ghost had said about me that I rushed and got my King James to say, Heavens, it must not be in there. I got to see. And I found it all there. Now that shows what words can do for you. See, preachers, don't complicate your message. Keep it simple, saints. Verse 1, listen to me. Okay, that gets my ear. Attention. Listen to me. The Lord called you before your birth. Do you believe that about you? Our focus today, he gave commandment. He came back from the dead, stopped off. With us 40 days, gave commandment to the ones he had chosen. Hallelujah. We're on his team. Listen to me. The Lord called you before your birth. Let me say something here. In Pentecost, we teach the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. And, and, and we somehow, you know, we went through a whole, uh, whole deal where uh, we called it the latter rain. I wasn't part of it. I was overseas. It was strange to me. But anyhow, they were, the whole thing was, you remember the latter rain? Some of you older folks remember that epoch? After the voice of healing epoch, and then the latter rain epoch. Some of you younger ones remember, you read it in history. Uh, they were giving gifts to people. Laying hands on people and giving them gifts. Big deal. Worked good. It was wonderful. And a lot of people, you know, did some pretty silly things. These gifts. I've wondered if we uh, aren't born with a lot of these gifts. That's what I think. I think, you know, and I think the proof. I've said this. I've said, I, I think ever pimp and ever madam was born called to preach. But they're misusing their talents. They're destroying people. God gave them the gift to build people. But they don't know it. And so they spend their life ruining people. 
trafficking in human flesh. Getting rich on it. I wonder if they weren't all born to preach. The reason I say that, they're leaders. Look at those pimps. Mean, sorry, cruel, heartless, selling beautiful girls, buying them, ruining them, cold-blooded. Why do people follow them? They always have a gang up around them. Always some more than, what, what is there about them, their charisma, that attracts them? See? They're gifted. They're gifted. They can get people to follow them. They've learned how to manipulate people and people follow them. People lay down their life for them. Proof of my theory. Paul. Read the first chapter of Galatians. Paul. Killing Christians. Persecuting them. Punishing them. Tormenting them. Arresting them. Taking them to prison. And then one day. He met Jesus. And he said. He concluded. From the day that God separated me from my mother's womb. He had chosen me to reveal his son in me. See. I think that's heavy proof of that theory. These talents that people have, you see them, you know, they're gifted in different ways. God gave them those talents. He gave them those talents in his mind, in his plan, that they would show Jesus. They would carry on Jesus' ministry. They would have ability. Maybe they could get money so they could, they could carry out gospel enterprises. They're gifted uh, uh, artists, all, all kinds of people, all kinds of trades. God has given us those gifts because his dream, they would be his representatives in this world. I believe that. That's why this chapter is beautiful to me. Listen to me. The Lord called you before your birth. Do you believe that about you? I believe that about me. I believe that. Verse 3. He said to you, You are my servant, a prince of power with God. Are you hearing me? You are my servant, a prince of power with God, and you shall bring me glory. I think I'm doing that all the time for God. I think He's so proud of me. I'm a prince of power with God. I'm bringing Him glory. Hallelujah. And I'm happy doing it. And He's happy that I'm doing it because I'm fulfilling His dream. And the Lord knows He's fulfilling my dreams. Hallelujah. We're together. We're friends. Listen to this. Verse 5. The Lord formed you can I ask you today in this session, take this to heart. Take this to heart. Take this to heart. Let this brand you for life. The Lord formed you. He commissioned you. He has given you the strength to perform the task. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. And here, my dear friend, you said I think T.L. Is a, is a man that God respects. Here it is. And he honors you for doing it. Did you hear that? That lineup. The Lord formed you. He commissioned you. He gave, he's given you strength to perform the task. And he honors you for doing it. That's the way I feel about the ministry. That's the way I live. That's the way I travel. That's the way I arrive in a community. That's the way I'm going to Poland. I believe God will honor me for going to Poland. And these other countries. But I don't know. Poland just seems to me like we've got to help Poland. Can you take some more? Verse 6. He will make you a light to the nations of the world 
to bring His salvation to them too. Oh, hallelujah for that. Can I read it again? He will make you a light to the nations of the world to bring His salvation to them too. That's our mission. We can't stop with America. Wigglesworth did. Amy did. Dowie did. But we can't. TL didn't. We did it in America, but we did it in the world. 78 nations. Hallelujah. And more coming up. Because He, He will make you a light to the nations of the world to bring His salvation to them too. Now, verse 7. Get ready. Buckle your seatbelt. This gets good. Oh, hallelujah. I love it. Listen. Verse 7. The Lord, the Redeemer, the Holy One. Boy, when He stacks up three big titles like that, He must mean He wants you to pay attention. You believe that? Yeah. Why not? Yes. 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 I will set up and take notice. Yes, my Lord. I'm at attention. I hear you. Hallelujah. Thank you for honoring me to speak to me. Yes. The Lord, the Redeemer, the Holy One says. Listen to what he says. He says, T.L., Mary, Edith, John, kings will stand at attention when you pass by. Do you believe that? Princes shall bow before you because the Lord has chosen you. Hallelujah. I believe that. He, the Lord, chooses you. He repeated that. Verse 8 and 9. He says, listen to what he says. Through you, I am saying to the prisoners of darkness, come out. I am giving you your freedom. Wow. 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 Can you find anything better than that? Isaiah 49. We've given that to Jesus all the time. That's beautiful. But Jesus has put his headquarters at my house. He lives in me. And so that is the prophecy of the Jesus who lives in me. And God says. And you know, we know that. We know that. Don't turn over and look. Just be sure that you got this clear. Second Corinthians uh, 5. Just look at that real close so that the devil can never steal it from you. Verse 18, 2 Corinthians 5, 18. All things are of God. You with me? 2 Corinthians 5, 18. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. He's reconciled us. You ever look up that word reconciled? It's a beautiful word. And has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. It's in our hands. He sat down. He fixed it all up. Now, he can sit down. He's given us this ministry. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. He's repeating that whole thing twice to be sure we get it clear. Now, then, we are ambassadors for Christ. It's as though, isn't this beautiful? It's as though, Paul makes it so clear, it's as though God did, dis, did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. It's as though God was speaking to people through you, telling them, be reconciled to God. Now, here, over here in, 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 uh, Isaiah 40, uh, 9, he says, through you, I am saying, to the, through you, I am talking. 
It's as though God did beseech you by me, by us, be reconciled. Through you, I'm saying to the prisoners of darkness, come out. I'm giving you your freedom. Friends, that's what we are. I stood before a Kikuyu multitude in Nyeri, Kenya. And I preached. It's the most, one of the most precious crusades that I've ever witnessed. They're such precious people. Very smart people. The Kikuyus. And one day I was inspired. And I lifted up my voice and I told them. I got there. Hey, listen. I want to say something to you. I come to you with full authority from my government. And they listened. They thought I was talking about the USA. You know. I said, I come to you with full authority from my government that has sent me here to bring good things to you. And then I, then I, then I laid it out to him. I said, I've come from God. And God is with me. I've come as his messenger. And the words that I speak to you are his words. And his power validates his words. And I've come to tell you truth. And when you know truth, God will vindicate, God will validate this truth. <clears throat> and I laid it out before him very carefully. I, I said, and, and, and I preached about Jesus. This is toward the end of the crusade. I said, do you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And all this. Do you believe that he died for your sins? Do you believe that he shed his blood? I went over every one of those questions. Do you believe that he was buried on your behalf? Do you believe that God raised him from the dead? Do you believe that he's alive today? Do you believe that he's come back and he's in our midst? Yes, 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 yes. All of them. Yes, yes, yes. Because they knew these things. See? And when I'd finished all that, I said, then I stand before you as a messenger of heaven, an ambassador of of God. And you know, to those precious people, those are heavy words. They're not stupid. They're smart, but they're not used to hearing those kind of words. See? And I said, I stand as an ambassador of God, and I have full authority of my government in heaven to make an announcement to you. Every one of you who are sick are healed. I have authority to tell you that the source of your disease is condemned by my Father in heaven and it has no further authority to live in you. Only believe. You know, there were tears all over the audience. And then I came, first, actually the first, I said, I have authority to tell you that your sins, whatever they were that you've committed, today I announce with authority on behalf of God Almighty in heaven, I announce your sins are forgiven and they're gone and they're put away. And you are now standing before God on this hillside with no sin left between you and God if you believe those things I said. And they were weeping. And then I came back and did the same thing about the sick. And when I finished that about sick, I'm witness to you, crutches and canes and beds all over that hillside were abandoned. They were healed. They were healed. Friends, we're chosen. We're chosen. You can do that. You can do that. You can do that. You can minister to people. You say, what if they don't get healed? Well, I, I, I wouldn't expect that they didn't get healed. I expect that they do get healed. I, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't minister to them until I had taught them the reason they can be healed. See, see we, we, we think people know everything we know. No. Teach them where sickness came from. Teach them why God doesn't want it, but why the devil does want it. 
and what Jesus paid to lift it from us, teach them that. Tell them that. Tell them that. Preach that. Teach that. Drill that. Now, if you only believe, and I believe with you, then the question, well, if I pray for them and it don't happen, then what? Believe. Only believe. Believe in the life of God in them. Don't judge them. It's not like it looks like it, like it, you'd like for it to be. Don't judge them. Don't say, yeah, well, there must be something wrong in your life or you to got it because I prayed I know I'm good. No, 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 no. no. Don't judge them, but minister to them and love them and encourage them to believe that the life of Jesus Christ has come into them and has filled them and that sickness dies and withers in the presence of the life of God. That's not hard for me to believe. I believe that. And I believe the word that I have taught them are the seeds of eternal life that have come into them and that those seeds will bear fruit. His word cannot return to him void. So encourage them and, and the, help them and minister to them and encourage them because if they get down in the dumps and get to frowning and get to worrying, that's not watering the seed with joy and praise to God. No, we've got to move forward, but we've got to believe in our authority. And, and listen to me, young people, listen to me. Minister to people like that. Minister with faith. Minister with power. Minister with authority. And I'm telling you, across the board, in your lifetime, if you'll do that, you'll have your miracles to talk about. Everybody I pray for, don't jump and get healed as soon as I pray. But a lot of them have. And I tell about them. I don't know the tens of thousands that I prayed for that they didn't jump and get healed. And I wish they would have. And they were staring me in the face. I wanted them to, but they didn't. But a lot of them did. And I don't have the answer. A fellow came to me not long ago and said, my wife's in a wheelchair. What do I do? We go out and pre can we preach? I said, sure, go and preach. I know preachers that preach from a wheelchair and line up people and pray for the sick and minister to the sick. Well, but why are they in the wheelchair? I said, I don't know. I don't have all the answers, but I know God's Word's good. And just because I'm crippled, I'm not going to refrain from preaching God's Word. Daisy died. I don't know why she died. I didn't want her to die. I was mad at God when she died. I don't like for her to die. I want her to live. But I'm not going to quit preaching. I know the Word is true. Hallelujah. And I know a lot of people that didn't die. See? We can't be so cocksure and think we got all the answers. I'm telling you, not many people like that. Them that think they are, I don't. Yeah, they don't know everything. They're bluffing about a lot of it. We're human. You can get so stuck up on your rules in the Bible that you'll scare people. No, we're humans. We're ministers. We love God. But we're not going to deny our integrity. Forsake our integrity. We're going to stick to the Word of God and believe it, but believe it not with a... A, 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 a clenched fist pounding the desk. And, no, but with joy and happiness and, and, and peace and tranquility and love and hope and joy and minister so that the hurting people won't be afraid of us. So that they'll come and be with us. Even if they don't get healed, they'll feel good among us. They won't feel condemned because we prayed for them and they didn't get it. So there's bound to be a sinner, some secret sin in their life. And they'd have got it because I know I'm a saint and I prayed right and I know right and I told you right and you didn't get it. So something wrong with you and you don't see them next Wednesday. They don't come because they're uncomfortable in our arrogant spiritual atmosphere. We can't do that. We got to love people. We got to help people. People are people. If you think you've got all the answers, if you're going to wait to get all the answers before you set out and go, well, you just well crawl in the hole now and die because you're not going to have all the answers. The older I get, the less answers I've got, but I haven't lost my joy. I'm happy. Hallelujah. And I can trust what I don't understand to him who does understand everything and leave that with him and keep on preaching love and help people. Hallelujah. 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 Well, he's our example. 
That's number one. He's our inspiration. That's number two. He's our commander. Number three. Number four. He chose us and sent us. His calling calls for our action. He gave commandment to those he chose. He sends me. If the Father sent me, I send you. Jesus talks about being sent by God in all but three chapters in the book of John. He closes his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7 with action. Verse 24, Therefore whoever hears these sayings of mine and doeth them, I'll liken him to a wise person which built his house on the rock. We're wise. God thinks we're smart. Hallelujah. I like to be smart. I know I'm smart because I act on his word. Hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Verse 25, and the rain descended and the floods came. The wind blew and the beat upon that house and it fell not, bless God. Poor devil. You couldn't bring it down because it was founded on a rock. Verse 26, and everyone that hears these things, a man does them not, is a foolish person. Build his house on the sand. Rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell. Great was the fall of it. It was a collapse. Doer of the word. Not just a hearer only. James 1, 22. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving your own self. I don't want to deceive myself. Bad enough to deceive other people. It's awful when you deceive yourself. For Verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself and goes away and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. Yeah? That, that's what it is. You forget who you are if you don't do what, do what God said do. You do what God said do, you'll remember who you are because it takes the power of God flowing through you. It keeps you ignited. Glory to God. But if you don't do it, if you just talk about it and rationalize it and theorize on it, you'll forget and get all tangled up about yourself and you'll be good for nothing. But do it and you remember who you are. Hallelujah. Yeah, I'm a man. Hey! <laughs> yes. Glory to God. You believe that? Verse 24, yeah. Verse 25, but whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein. That's it. Look at this thing. And continue. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man is blessed in his deed. Faith without action is dead. Love without action is dead. James 2.14, what does it profit, my brother, my sisters, if a man say, or a woman say, he or she has faith and has not worked, can faith save them? No, no, no. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to him, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what good does it do? See, Verse 70, even so faith, if they don't have action, it's dead. Remember these verses before. <laughs> Verse 18, yea, a man may say, you have faith, I have worked. Show me your faith without your work. I'll show you my faith by my works. Come and watch what I do and you'll know what I believe. Amen? That's the way I've been all my life. Pastor Doherty told about me starting out that little toy press. Yeah? That's what I did. I took them little tracks, them little tracks. I was real touched. My dad died pretty old. Before he died, he came to see me one time, and he pulled out his billfold, old worn billfold, the, the curve of his hip, you know, the poor old thing. And he poured it for years and years and years on the farm. And he, he was grinning to me, and he pulled way down, looked way back in the pocket, and pulled out a little. He had one of them little tracks. He was proud of that. See, he was proud of me. To, to go to the world. He never told me so, but he smiled at me and showed me that. I knew what he meant. God bless him. You know, it, a doer, a doer. I used, I, uh, and, and, and you know, you know, taking those few little scraps of paper, I, I couldn't buy paper, but I, we had sacks and things, and I could pick them out and take the scissors and make, make the size and, and, and go give them to people. 
And just think today, we're printing by the tons, by the tons, by the tons, 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 tons. 20, we, print, we printed around over, I think, over 40 tons already in Colombia, in Spanish. Russia, 24 tons. And then we went back and printed 22 tons more. And now we're printing another big shipment. It's going to be about 20, about 18 tons for Poland. Think of that. Tons. I'm talking, I'm talking lots of stuff. And Poland, isn't that wonderful? And we're working on a deal right now. And there's a brother, uh, there's some folks here that's going to help me if you speak French, if you're good at French, if you know French. I've got to have top literary French. If you know, if there's any French people here, I won't know about it. Because I'm, I'm busy translating our, our ten major books. I'm not doing it by having it done. And I've got to proof all them. And I'm telling you, that takes time. And I don't have the time. I've got to do it because we've got to get them on the press over in Belgium so we can get them shipped out to these ten different countries of Africa and Madagascar. Take weeks and weeks to get them down there. We've got to work away in advance. So it's a, it's a humongous job that we're undertaking. But I reckon it's going to be about, it'll take at least 50 ton and I think probably 70 tons of them uh, to, to, to be able to ship enough to each one of these countries because we'll have about 5,000 people minimum at, at each national event that we conduct. We'll spend a week in each country preaching morning and night. And at the end of each of those meetings, we're going to put 10 copies, 10 of our books in French in the hands of everybody that attends. Now, when we do that, we'll change those nations. We'll teach for a week. That'll change them. But then we seal it with this truth. Think what this means. I predict in five years from now, we'll see great revival break out throughout French Africa. And here's what I predict. I, I believe. I don't say it prophetically, but it could be taken that way. It's all right. I predict. I, I'm just talking logistics. We're going to see revival break out across French, African, Madagascar, and they are going to go to France. To France. And they are going to invade France, and they're going to win the French. God bless the French. They're haughty. They're, they're stubborn. They're stuffy. They're sniffy. They're the custodians of the culture of the world. And we are les sauvages, you know. We are the savages. We've got all this space out here. We don't know what to do with it. But we're learning little by little from them how to do things. And we come over there and their nose is in the air. And they're sweet to us, but they are sophisticated, beautiful people. And they have never moved with God. The only people in France that's moved with God have been the gypsies and, and the beautiful African people. They're the only ones. And the French, when they get in trouble... They run to the gypsies or run to the Africans to get a miracle. And then they go back. Mais nous devons les évangéliser. Nous avons décidé d'y aller en Afrique afin de convaincre les Africains. Et les Africains, ils vont venir aux France pour prêcher aux Français. Et les Français vont croire, je vous garantis qu'ils vont croire en Jésus-Christ. Gloire à Dieu. Et nous allons voir l'accomplissement de la volonté de Dieu. Je vous garantis ça. You believe that? Amen. Hallelujah. It is true, it is true, it is true. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. We got to go home. Hallelujah. Oh boy, I got to, I'm on page 8 of 17. Well, I'm gaining. Oh, hey, no, no, no. Wait, 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 wait. wait. He chose us and sent us. Oh, I, can you hang on a minute? Sure enough, I, I got to give you this good. You ask, what can I do? How do I get guidance? When I pray, how do I know God's will? The basic, see, I should have got to this sooner. Three ways to know God's will. Is it good for God? Is it good for people? Is it good for you? If it is, go for it. It's God's will. Now, that's not all the story. Knowing that, when you pray to God, and say, oh Lord, this great idea that I've come up with, it's good for you, it's good for people, it's good for me. 
I want to paint you a picture. Remember, God's sitting down up there. Jesus sitting down with him. They'd done all their part. You got this idea. Oh God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Is it okay? Is it right? Yeah, he says, yes. He smiles. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You're right on, child. Good. Yeah. Oh, uh, then, then, then. Oh, he says, oh, yeah. But then, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Now, what am I going to do about it? I've done my part. I laid all the groundwork. All fixed. What are you going to do? You like the idea? Go for it. World's yours. I've given it everything. Everything we got up here, I've given to you. Is that okay to take that picture? I really believe that's where we need to resolve our future. Yeah, I got an idea. It's from God. It's God's will because it's good for Him. It's good for people. It's good for me. So, let's get with it. Let's not wait on God. He's waiting on us. Now, that, see, that kind of contradicts the way we think. We've got to pray and wait for a white elephant to move across the scene. For something supernatural to happen. No, no. I said, I want to give you a picture. After he had purged our sins, he sat down. There's nothing else to do. Of course he'd sit down. You didn't want to keep standing all that time, did you? He did all this for us. He said, and we get the idea. We find out how to know God's will. We say, wow, wonderful, wonderful. And, and, and keep this in your mind. He says, now, child, I fixed everything for you. The garden is planted. The fruit is yours. Go for it. Now, what are you when you pray, when you know it's God's will and you pray to God about it, He has one answer for every prayer. It's yes. 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 Then He adds, yes. What are you going to do? What are you going to do about it? Yes. What are you going to do about it? Yes. Don't talk to me. What am I going to do? No, 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 no. What are you going to do about it? You got a mouth, you can talk. You got feet, you can walk. You've got my truth, you've got my name, you've got my righteousness, you've got my power. I'm with you, I love you, I provided for you, I'll back up, I'll never leave you, I'll always be with you. What are you going to do about it? You're going to sit on your death and keep praying for me to do something? No, I've done my part. I've sat down. I'm happy. The world's yours. Does that help you? Does that help you? Now, I think that's better than me build up a big emotional, spiritual deal that if you can get high enough in the heavenlies and in the holies to really get some big enough vision, then maybe someday God may do I just don't have any patience for that. I've been too far. I've been out there. We go make things happen. Hallelujah. We go make things happen. Glory to God. How, stand up. I, better, I, I won't look at this again. I won't look anymore. So I can shut up. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus, thank you. Jesus, we thank you. Oh, Jesus, we thank you. Oh, Jesus, how we depend on you. And then how you depend on us. Oh, I'm so glad, Lord, that we've gotten together the Christ connection. We're connected. Hallelujah. You're loving us. we loving you. You believe in us, we believe in you. You take care of us. Oh, thank you that we can carry your message. Thank you for it, Lord. Let the breath of God breathe upon us today. Let life, let it breathe into us. The breath of life by the Holy Spirit that will brighten our eyes with understanding. Hallelujah, until we can see the land as Abraham did and possess it in your name. For you have given us the minister of recon reconciliation. We are in charge in your name. 
and you are back of us, and you send us, you've chosen us, you believe in us. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, let something mighty take place in the life of every person. May their eyes be open, as Paul prayed. May the eyes of their understanding be open to understand, to perceive this power that was working when you raised Jesus from the dead and how it works usward, how it works in us, the same resurrection life that makes us dynamic, hallelujah, ministers, ambassadors, co-laborers with God, workers for the will of God with the gospel committed to our hands. Hallelujah. With the ministry of reconciliation committed to us, you are believing in us. We will do the job. Glory to God. We will do the job. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Say, Amen. 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 Clap your hands to the glory of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.